major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Thursday, September 22nd. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. After a two-year hiatus because of COVID, the Miramar Air Show is returning this weekend. But a coalition of groups says the show should have never come back. KPBS reporter John Carroll is live on the Carroll Canyon overpass where members of those groups are protesting. John, can you tell us why they want the air show to be canceled? Well, let me just set the scene. As you were saying, Maya, we are here on the overpass, and there are a little more than a dozen protesters here on the bridge. You can see many of them holding signs and the flags, Veterans for Peace. But to get to your question, in a word, the answer is climate. The groups include environmental activists, social justice groups, and the one group that's been against the air show for years, the Veterans for Peace. We're not here to kill a party, but the climate crisis is here to kill us as a species. Past president of the Veterans for Peace, Gary Butterfield, agrees the Miramar Air Show is entertaining, but he says that's not the point. Butterfield says the cost of the enormous amount of pollution going into the atmosphere over the next three days just isn't worth it. As citizens of San Diego, we're being asked to make sacrifices to reduce our carbon footprint. And we feel it's incumbent upon the military, especially the Navy and Marines, to do the same. We're putting on the air show for a couple of different objectives. Not surprisingly, the Marines see it differently. We really want to build that camaraderie with the local community. We finally get, after three years, the chance to bring our local partners in, our local friends, our neighbors, and show them what we what we do. Second Lieutenant Jacoby Hawkins says the Marine Corps admits the air show does emit a lot of pollution, but he says that's not the whole story. He points to ways the Miramar Air Base is working to be environmentally friendly. We have the microgrid on base, which is supplying energy to homes in San Diego. Uh, and then we're looking at things to lessen our carbon output, our footprint as well. The Pentagon has long acknowledged that the climate crisis is a threat to our national security. Butterfield says ending the air show would be a gesture of goodwill, that the military is serious. Every little bit helps, and this is something that is optional and for entertainment. It's choking us. It's code red for humanity. Protesters will be out here on the Carroll Canyon overpass until 6 tonight. This is the final protest that they've had several of over the last couple of weeks. Live over the 15, John Carroll, KPBS News. Maya? John, thank you for that report. Can you tell us what about the air show being canceled in the future? What is the word on that? I did ask Lieutenant Hawkins about that, and he would not go that far, naturally, but he did say that it may be modified in the near future to be more environmentally friendly. Maya. Thanks so much for that report, John Carroll. He has been caught. The man dubbed Fat Leonard was arrested in Venezuela after fleeing home detention earlier this month in San Diego. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has the story. Leonard Francis is at the center of a wide-ranging Navy corruption case. He cut his GPS ankle monitor and fled September 4th, weeks before his sentencing. Earlier this week, Francis was arrested at the airport in Caracas by Venezuelan authorities, according to the U.S. Marshal Service. Venezuelan authorities say Francis was headed to Russia. Singapore-based journalist Tom Wright interviewed Francis for a podcast in 2021. He says the former Malaysian contractor had detailed information on the Navy after years of bribing officers to steer business to his ports. Had top secret uh, ship schedules and that kind of thing. Those would be outdated now because he's been in detention for nine years, but he still knows how the U.S. Uh, Navy operates and that would have been extremely valuable to a country like Russia. 
Francis traveled to Mexico and Cuba before arriving in Venezuela. Wright says Leonard may have fled because he believed that he was about to go to prison. This despite cooperating with federal prosecutors over the years in cases that netted over 30 Navy officials. You know, he's been a cooperating witness for nine years. So he's, in his mind, he's done nine years already in, in jail and home, home arrest. And his sentencing's coming up and he's thinking, oh my God, I could do up to 20 years and, and no one else is getting really punished for that amount of time. This morning in San Diego federal court, a judge postponed Francis's sentencing hearing until December. The U.S. has limited extradition with Venezuela, which may complicate Francis's return to the United States. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. The arson trial for the USS Bonhomme Richard continued today with prosecutors attempting to place seaman apprentice Ryan Mays at the scene of the fire. Mays is charged with arson and hazarding a vessel for the fire that burned along the San Diego waterfront for nearly five days in July of 2020. Petty Officer Kenji Velasco is the prosecution's key witness. Velasco testified that he was on watch the morning of the fire and saw Mays going into the area where the fire started. Mays' attorney questioned why Velasco initially told investigators that he didn't recognize the person who passed him. He initially told NCIS that he never saw the person before. He didn't recognize the person. Um, and then as pointed out in cross-examination, uh, toward the end of that interview when NCIS asked him, well, you know, is there any rumors, any, you know, and that's when he said, well, maybe, maybe Mays. Prosecutors are expected to finish their case tomorrow. Another interest rate hike from the Federal Reserve is officially here. It's the fifth increase this year as the Fed tries to curb inflation. KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer looks at what that means for your finances. In its quest to bring down inflation, running near its highest level since the early 1980s, the Federal Reserve raised benchmark interest rates by another three quarters of a percentage point. That rate hike impacts interest rates on everything from credit cards to auto loans and adjustable rate mortgages. Carolyn Freund is UC San Diego's Dean of Global Policy and Strategy. So if you want to buy that new car, or that new house, it's more expensive than it was just a few months ago. So this pulls back on consumption, which then puts less pressure on prices, so inflation goes down. Locally, a cannabis company partnered with a national nonprofit to raise $250,000 of medical debt for some San Diegans, including Landon Young. I have a lot more money for groceries, uh, gas, um, rent even, and uh, this has been a, a massive weight off of my shoulders. He says inflation and rising interest rates were taking a toll on him. I have a small amount of student loans that I was also kind of juggling um, during this time, and so I, I was kind of um, having to determine like which bills I was going to pay first and what amounts, and uh, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a dire situation at the time. UCSD's Freund says the interest rate hikes are hitting low-income earners the hardest. If any big purchase you want where you need to borrow, it makes it much, much more difficult. So that's how it works to slow the economy because people don't make those big purchases. Um, but for people who need them, it's, uh, it's very damaging. The Fed's five hikes so far in 2022 have increased rates by a combined three percentage points. That's about $300 in interest added on every $10,000 in debt. The Fed indicated it will keep hiking interest rates in order to tamp down on inflation. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. Mortgage rates are now the highest they've been since 20, 2008, following the latest interest rate hike. According to Freddie Mac, the average for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage hit nearly 6.3% today. This time last year, it was only 2.8%. As rates climb, home prices have started to soften and sales have decreased. But there is still a shortage of available homes for sale. Starting tomorrow, we'll see even fewer people wearing face coverings in California. State health officials are easing mask guidelines for places including jails, prisons, homeless shelters, and cooling centers. Masks will come back if hospital numbers rise. Dozens of California counties, including San Diego, are in the low COVID category, according to the CDC. Masks will still be required in health care facilities and senior care settings. Deadly protests continue in Iran after a death of a young woman is blamed on the morality police for not properly wearing a headscarf. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado spoke with local Iranian leaders. 
Iranians have been protesting for almost a week after 22-year-old Masha Amini died after being taken into custody by the morality police for not wearing her headscarf properly. Women have led the protest by burning their hijabs and cutting their hair on the streets and on social media. But now many sites on the internet are also being blocked. Iranian state media says 17 people have been killed in the unrest. Tremendous sadness. Tremend Mehdi Mohan was born in Iran and lives in San Diego. He says Iranian Americans are distressed by the images and news coming out of the country. It has had a tremendous impact on all of us, in particular those of us that are parents. Moen says two separate issues are causing the unrest. The first, the cause of Amini's death. The president of Iran has ordered an investigation and offered condolences to the family, but that hasn't been enough. Moen says the investigation must be transparent and happen quickly. This particular issue, the loss of a beautiful young um, intelligent woman is is investigated, addressed, and and you know, situation is corrected such that it will not happen in the future. He says the second is the root cause of the anger among people in cities throughout the country. And that anger, uh, I think, um, has to do with the fact that some of the young that are on the streets might think that they are not being uh, listened to. And then he offered some beautiful words from a Persian poet and philosopher, Sadi. We're all belonging to the human family um, as a member, as a body. And if one member of that body is ill, the entire body will be ill. The women of Iran need to be respected. Their desires need to be heard. We reached out to several other Iranian Americans in San Diego. They declined interviews because they fear their families in Iran would be punished if they went public with their thoughts. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, Senator Joe Manchin's proposal to speed up the approval of energy projects divides Democrats in Congress. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Officials have turned to mental health conservatorships as a potential fix to the homelessness crisis. But the system is already struggling to serve the state's most vulnerable residents. KPBS partner iNewsource found fewer conservatorships are being pursued in San Diego County, even as some local leaders support expansion. The lack of data and oversight also raises major questions about whether growing the program will actually work. Here you have what seems like this incredibly important coercive part of the mental health system, and yet there's absolutely no visible strategy statewide of how are we using this tool. And you can read more about this story online at inewsource.org. A new building will open on the campus of UC San Diego tomorrow, housing all kinds of engineers designing products that have never been seen before. Franklin Antonio Hall is named after the late Qualcomm co-founder and as KPBS education reporter MG Perez shows us there's already futuristic work being done there. So I might represent a remote student um, attending school virtually. That's Alex Chow, a graduate student at UC San Diego, working on his master's degree in computer science. He's actually 100 miles away at home in Riverside, remotely operating a new robot that's in development on the campus in La Jolla. So with this robot, um, you could you know, move the robot around like so, uh, turn around the environment, grab stuff with the arm, and the gripper and basically interact with your with your classmates uh, to get a more immersive experience of school while you're at home. Chow is one member of a team of UCSD graduate students experimenting with this bionic simulated person that could someday soon help children with special needs. Pratusha Gosh is also on the team doing research for her PhD dissertation. If they're unable to physically attend school, 
then they may be able to use this robot to actually actively participate in school as a robot. This group project is happening on the second floor of the brand new Franklin Antonio Hall, named after the late Qualcomm co-founder who was a UCSD graduate. Antonio donated $30 million of the $180 million it costs to construct the four-story state-of-the-art building designed by engineers to house the next generations of engineers. We're bursting at the seams. Albert Pisano was a good friend of Franklin Antonio. He is also the dean of the UC San Diego Jacobs School of Engineering, which has reached a record enrollment of almost 10,000 students. This new building makes room for growth and brings students, professors, researchers, and industry leaders together under one solar-powered roof. When you sit in this building, you are simultaneously motivated to look out and to work within, to collaborate and to think big thoughts independently. The building is divided into more than a dozen collaboratories, labs with collaboration going on every day on every floor. Right now we're working on a home robot that can take your groceries and put them away. Henrik Christensen is director of robotics. He teaches and mentors mechanical and electrical engineering students and also those who are working on degrees in computer science who design software to make the magic happen. Now I get to have them all in the same space and this makes a big difference for them to talk to each other, to really understand how can they complement each other on building products we've never seen before. It isn't your grandfather's engineer anymore, I can assure you that. In the past 10 years, Pisano and his team have led the Jacobs School into the top 10 engineering universities in the country. He says the new home that was built on what used to be a parking lot will keep the school in the top 10. Housing research in artificial intelligence, development of powerful long-lasting batteries for electric cars, and this. Making thin film sensors, even less intrusive than a Band-Aid, that not only can understand what's going on with your metabolism, but be powered by the very sweat that your skin exudes. No batteries. Try to move the robot towards the target. The learning curve and vibe running through Antonio Hall is just getting started as unpacking and setup continues. There is no social distancing here. Engineers are working side by side and face to face. As the saying goes, if you build it, they will come. And they have. Cedric Girard is a postdoctorate engineer from Lyon, France, working on a device that will make colonoscopies much more comfortable. Professors are closer to each other in this space, so it's easier for discussions. It's, uh, I think it creates a more dynamic environment for collaborations. Pisano has the welcome mat out. The world is filled with issues that need to be addressed now. A workable solution now is better than a perfect solution later. So the future is now, and it's happening in real time. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. San Diego Salk Institute has just received its biggest grant ever to help create a map of the human brain. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge has more on the effort, diving into the brain's 90 billion neurons. Salk neuroscientist Margarita Behrens has spent many hours working in a lab where mouse brain diagrams are taped to the wall. They represent five years of research into the composition of the mouse brain. We have a very, very good atlas of the mouse brain, but we don't have a very, very good atlas of the human brain. And that's where the National Institutes of Health's Brain Initiative comes in. The NIH has awarded Salk, UC San Diego, and two other universities a $126 million grant to create an atlas of the human brain. Salk's share of the funding is $77 million. It's the biggest grant in the Institute's history. The director of the newly created research center is Salk biologist and professor Joe Ecker. He explains the center's goal. To try to understand what are the differences in those cell types in the different layers of the cortex, for example, of your brain where you have executive functions or motor functions, et cetera. And so it's a really a kind of a sampling 
process at this stage to try to understand, you know, to build, to build maps, basically, of the information within those cells. He hopes this information may lead to gene therapies that can target only the cell populations where the treatment is needed. How will researchers study the brain? Egger reaches for something on the top of his desk. Actually, I have my um, my coffee cup here sitting on a, a what would be a slice of a brain. This is just a, 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 an image of a brain. The research will rely on people who donate their brains to science, and the brains will be cut into slices. Barron says brains that are harvested quickly from cadavers can still function for the benefit of research. The person is dead. The cells are not. Hmm? The cells keep functioning for a while. You can keep that uh, tissue alive. After five years of research, Ecker hopes we will know more about treating brain disorders like Alzheimer's disease and autism. What we're counting on is that we'll have significant information in five years about cell types to derive the kind of information that will help geneticists say, oh, okay, uh, those genetic variants lie in these regions of the genome that are controlling gene expression in this part of the brain and in these cell types, and that that will be valuable information. For the Brain Initiative, Salk will study 30 human brains. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. It's the first day of astronomical fall. And fall is arriving on the calendar only because we've got a bit of a summery surge of weather that's going to be returning over the next few days. We think the heat will peak early next week, probably Monday, maybe spilling into Tuesday before the next round of relief arrives. There are no marine threats the next few days, though, so that means if you're trying to head toward the water to beat the heat, you'll be able to do so safely, but even the beach locations will be warming up over the next few days. The most moist conditions where all that deep monsoon moisture is now generally to the east of California, so it's not as humid as it could be with some of our recent bouts of heat, but still not going to be feeling great over the next few days as we see these temperatures on the rise. Overnight tonight, a clear, quiet night, 66 degrees. We'll do it on the low side in the metro region wide. No weather worries, generally clear. You'll see some of those stars out there. Low 60s, upper 50s toward the coastal regions. Borrego Springs, 73 degrees overnight. Friday, that warm-up gets underway. The upper level area of high pressure begins to strengthen over the Great Basin. That turns up the temperatures from Nevada down into California. And as I mentioned, even toward the coast, not really escaping this upcoming heat wave. We're talking about 90s inland, hundreds toward the deserts. Even San Diego down to Chula Vista, low 80s during the day on Friday and then over the weekend that's when the heat peaks Saturday Sunday Monday maybe even into Tuesday we're going 5 to 15 degrees above normal what does that translate to well here you go at the coast we're talking low to mid 80s wall-to-wall -wall sunshine but it's going to be quite warm even as you head toward that Pacific Ocean to get some heat relief inland 92 Saturday around 90 again on Sunday and then mid 90s by Monday sunny and hot in the mountains, it, this is where it's coolest, but still warmer than it should be for this time of the year. Still wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. And in the deserts, temperatures peaking into the upper triple digits by the time we get to Sunday and Monday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Ben Reppert with your AccuWeather forecast. Back to you. This weekend, you can stay home and stream, or you can hit the theater. KPBS cinema junkie Beth Accomando gives us her recommendations. <laughs> The latest Star Wars series to hit cable is Andor. It offers the backstory to Diego Luna's Cassian Andor, the reluctant hero of Rogue One. I was eager for this series. I loved Rogue One, and this show promised to be a grittier, more human-scaled look at how anger at an oppressor can spark a full-blown revolution. The first two episodes focus on Cassian the Thief. To steal from the Empire? What do you need? A uniform, some dirty hands, and an Imperial toolkit? They're so proud of themselves, they don't even care. But it's not until episode three and the arrival of actors Stellan Skarsgård and Fiona Shaw that we start to feel the swell of rebellion and the passion of a cause. People are standing up. 
the first two episodes felt like fluff and unnecessary filler. But with episode three, the series comes into its own. That's what a reckoning sounds like. I hope Andor continues to build on these themes and to give us something needier than what the franchise has been serving up. So far, it has not proven as strong as The Mandalorian, but it is far outpacing Boba Fett and Obi-Wan in terms of production value and story. Olivia Wilde's Booksmart was an indie charmer about high school best friends. With Don't Worry Darling, the director challenges herself with something darker and more complex. But it's all wrapped up in a sunny package of mid-century model home perfection. Jack, wait! Don't Worry Darling has shades of the Stepford Wives as it serves up an experimental utopian community that starts to show some cracks. They're lying to all of us. I can't talk to you right now, Margaret. No one asks any questions. But Alice decides to ask questions, and the answers are not comforting. Don't Worry Darling has two strengths, Florence Pugh's anchoring performance as Alice and Wilde's picture-perfect visual style. There's wonderful creepiness in how mundane things like saran wrap or a sliding glass door can abruptly become suffocating symbols in Alice's idyllic home. The film falls apart, however, in the final act, where a twist provokes an aha gasp, but then leaves you feeling cheated and disappointed. Don't Worry Darling confirms Wilde's talents as a director, but perhaps she needs to be more discerning about the scripts she takes on. It also reconfirms Pew as an acting powerhouse. Beth Commando, KPBS News. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. The Pentagon holds its first ever Energy Expo. NPR's Morning Edition looks at how Green Energy is marketing itself to the military. And KPBS Midday Edition, we're rounding up the best arts, culture, and entertainment happening in San Diego County this weekend. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following, by viewers like you. Thank you.